ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to whatever part this is of my July 2021 Blu-ray collection update series. The premium collection, the HMV premium collection, I have quite a few of them as you can see. And uh, there was a two for £15 sale, which is a wonderful sale that I've partaken in many times. Partaken in, a correct phrase, but I have indulged in. That, that's definitely a phrase. I've indulged in this sale many times over the years. And dating back to the first um, batch of releases of this collection, I was sent them by, um, I think it was Warner Brothers at the time. I'm not entirely sure. But uh, there was some press release and I arranged to have the first batch of titles sent to me to showcase on my channel. There was like Gremlins 2, The Shining, there was a number of... Forbidden Planet was one of them. And um, I, I really like the look of them and I've said many times in the past that the premium collection is kind of like the red-headed stepchild of the boutique labels. It's not quite a studio release. Um, but it's not quite a boutique label release either. It's somewhere in the middle and I really like them and when you get two for 15 pounds it's a pretty good deal to get uh, classic movies in nice packaging with slip boxes for £7.50. <sighs> but a sale is a sale. And when you have birthday money, and when you've sold some things that you've been meaning to sell for a, a few years, and you get some extra Blu-ray money, um, you do crazy things. And yeah, I bought a few of them. I went ahead and picked up 30. I can't even get half of them into frame, I don't think. Maybe there. That is absolutely ridiculous. So I'm gonna very carefully try and put them down and <laughs> go through them. Uh, I did a, a live stream with Graham over at Man V Film and we talked about the sale when it went live and I showed some of the first batches that I picked up. So I kind of went in a few waves to HMV and uh, I just kept coming back for more. And uh, where do I even start? I mean, I've, it's in a completely random pile, so that's I'm just going to go through it as I go through it. But, you know, there's just there's so much to talk about with these films. Many of them I haven't seen, most of them I haven't seen, but there's a reason for all of them, um, and so let's just, let's just dive in, Should we? Let's just, I mean, the longer I kind of procrastinate on uh, getting this thing started, the longer the video is going to be. So first up, and I, I, one thing I, I, I'm proud of myself for is that I, I'm not beholden to the spine numbers, because they do number these, and there's some that I'm just not that interested in, you know, um, and I, I don't want to be completist with these. Would it be nice to have a complete set? Yeah, kind of, you know. Um, I mean, there's no film in the collection I actively dislike that I've seen, but um, there's certainly a few that just uh, they don't really interest me that much. But then I do like seeing different parts of, you know, um, cinema, and I do like exposing myself to films that I don't usually watch. But anyway, there's a whole other thing. I think that quite a few, or at least a number of titles from the, the early... Um, spy numbers, the first few released, are now out of print. I think the mission is out of print. And actually, one of the ones I have here is a new release. Let me just check, I did actually pick it up. Yes, and it is apparently out of print already as well. There's maybe an issue there with Paramount. Anyway, let's get into this. The Haunting from 1999, I believe. Yes. I like that they have the year on the spine, and I, I have been storing them in kind of like color order on my shelves because I haven't really fully organized my collection again yet. But um, I would like to maybe go chronological with the way that I store these. Anyway, The Haunting, the 1999 version, the original, is in the collection also, which I watched maybe a couple of years ago. I really, really enjoyed the original. And I really like this film. I know people think it's shit. I haven't seen it in about 20 years, but I remember when my dad had a chipped cable box. Um, this is one of the, the premium movies that you could pay to watch, and I just watched it over and over again. And I really liked it. And th there's an actress in this who, Lily Taylor... She was really good. She didn't seem to really be in a lot more films that I've seen, at least, and uh, I thought she was really good in this. And you have a really good cast in Liam Neeson, Catherine Zeta-Jones, Owen Wilson, um, you know, a big name cast, I suppose, depending on what you would refer to as a big name. But yeah, um, there's a new um, filmmaker focus feature. So some of these do have new um, Paramount special features, um, which is really cool. 
but this, it says on the front here, a newly remastered Blu-ray. I highly doubt there's a new transfer on this, but it does have the new interview of the director, Jan de Bont, on The Haunting. And then uh, an original behind-the-scenes feature. You don't tend to get, like, ridiculous extras with these releases. Uh, and one thing I, I almost bought was the Casablanca release, because it has a nice thick booklet inside it. But And I, I, I thought that it would be nice to get it, because my... Casablanca Blu-ray is this big, you know, unwieldy box set. I thought it'd be nice to have just like a nice one to just slide onto the shelf. But I think I also have the Steelbook of Casablanca, which renders that that justification um, obsolete. I think. But I also thought to myself, well, it wouldn't look nice on the shelf when one of the premium collection Blu-rays is thicker than the others. But I, I refrained from buying that just because it just it would have been so arbitrary, and it's not like I consider Casablanca to be one of my favorite films. Um, now, now let me just see for, for the kind of, for my argument's sake, how many films I have seen in this stack of 30. Um, so we have, still haven't found one I've seen. Nope. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, and The Haunting makes six. So this one I have seen, and I definitely wanted to buy this, and it is Fatal Attraction. Fantastic film. Watch this, I think, last year or the year before, me and Connie reviewed it for the Epic Film Challenge 2. Fantastic thriller. Michael Douglas plays a man who has a one-night stand with Glenn Close's character, and he has a family and a, you know, a daughter, I believe, and, um, and Glenn Close becomes very obsessed with him. And it's kind of this, it's a really interesting film, and it's a brilliant thriller with great performances. And it, it, it really, it's a shame that the conversation around this film tends to veer towards the whole bunny boiler thing and how that became such a phrase. And, a, uh, and it is a memorable moment from the film, but it's so much more than just that kind of reference point, I think. Um, and this one has a commentary with the director, uh, a new interview with the director, Adrian Lin, and rehearsal footage, and the alternate ending, which I really want to see because they changed the ending, um, and radically so. And I love the ending of the film, so I'm intrigued to see how they originally ended it, but I really love Fatal Attraction. What a great thriller. I'd say one of my favorite all-time thrillers, in fact. Uh, this one is just a film I feel like I have to see, as I'm such a big fan of John Hughes. It's not a film that he um, uh, directed, but he wrote this film. When did it come out? Uh, 1986. When was John Hughes' first? I can't really remember the timeline. Well, I guess it's after Breakfast Club, so he was already directing films at this point. But uh, he once referred to Molly Ringwald as his uh, muse, I think. And so she appears in this film, but it's pretty in pink. Now, this says newly re remastered Blu-ray, and it does say on the back... A newly remastered Blu-ray from a 4K film transfer supervised by the director. And there is a new interview with the director and the original special features, including the original ending of the film. Never seen it, don't know anything about it, uh, and I've always wanted to see it. The kind of, um, they call them the Brat Pack, I think it was. That kind of, that group of young actors who were making films around that time. And, and mostly John Hughes, you know, kind of lead films whether he's writing or directing and stuff and I like those films a lot and I, I what was the one I saw recently I'd never seen before 16 Candles and that was one I felt like I needed to see and I really enjoyed that one so I'm looking forward to checking out Pretty in Pink this one is I mean really a blind buy it's not like I'm the, the biggest fan of Eddie Murphy but we have The Golden Child and I, I literally know nothing about this but it's an 80s movie it's an 80s Eddie Murphy movie. I, I do love Eddie Murphy, actually. I'm not like I'm not a fan, but I really enjoy him in certain films. Um, Trading Places is like an all-time favorite comedy for me, and uh, and there's a few other ones. And more recently, uh, what was the film called? Damn, it was such a good one. One of my favorite films of the past couple of years. Ah, Dolomite is my name. Is it is it Dolomite or just Dolomite is my name? I don't know. He's so good in Dolomite. That's such a great film. But uh, yeah, um, what was the other one? Uh, I haven't seen the 40 Hours movies. Beverly Hills Cop. I hadn't seen that before, and I watched it a few years ago and really enjoyed that. But I like kind of classic Eddie Murphy, so hopefully that'll be a good one to watch. Coming to America is one I've only vaguely seen. I've seen bits of it when I was a kid. Um, I really should get to that. And there's a sequel that just came out this year, too. Um, speaking of 80s movies that I feel like I should just see from 1983, we have Flashdance. 
Connie has wanted me to watch this for the longest time, so she will get her wish soon enough. This also has um, a new interview with the director, Adrian Lin, who also directed Fatal Attractions. So that's quite a quite a shift from a film like Flashdance. I at least vaguely know the, the vibe of Flashdance, and it's certainly not that of Fatal Attraction. I can't remember where I heard um, talk about this film, but it was on a podcast, a film podcast somewhere, and they were... Whoever it was who was, who was a guest on the show was really bigging up this particular film, and the film is Waiting for Guffman from 1996. Um, I would say I'm probably um, the the biggest Christopher Guest fan in the world. Like I would I would put that label on myself. I think I'm the biggest Christopher Guest fan in the world who's seen absolutely nothing he's done except for Spinal Tap. <laughs> I have like no knowledge of anything else he's ever done except for Nigel Tufnell. So. Uh, I feel like I, I owe it to myself to watch one of his other films. Uh, I think he directed this one as well. Yes, there's a commentary with director and co-writer Christopher Guest and co-star Eugene Levy. But from what I heard about this, it sounded really good. And I do like his style of comedy and that kind of... Uh, I mean, there's kind of a, a crew of them. There's, there's certainly like... Like Best in Show, you know, that's one I've seen clips of and have really enjoyed, but there's kind of Fred Willard, you know, certain actors who pop up again and again who work in this sphere with Christopher Guest and, and other people, so I, I have high hopes for enjoying that one. This one was like, they, they purely got me on this by, <laughs> by the extras, which is awful, it really is awful, but also it's another blind spot for me, and it is Musicals from 1954, Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. I'm not a musical guy, but I, I, I feel compelled to, to keep trying them and to just see. But this one is a two-disc special edition. And this is what got my damn collector brain kind of intrigued. There's a whole bunch of behind-the-scenes stuff on the first disc and an audio commentary with the director. But on the second disc, there is a rarely screened alternate version of the film in widescreen, um, in flat widescreen aspect ratio. That just intrigues me from a film history perspective. You know, call me crazy. I don't even know if it's even in HD, but um, I could open it up and see if it's a Blu-ray. Maybe I can do that right now. That'd be interesting. But yeah, Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. I feel like I've heard about it before, but um, I couldn't honestly say that I've heard anything particular as far as like, you know, oh yeah, it's that film that's about this. But I don't know, just even looking at the poster, it sounds interesting. Seven Brides, Brides for Seven Brothers. And it looks like it has that kind of classic Hollywood feel to it. I uh, might be completely off base on that. But uh, I hold my hands up to this one. Oh, that's a really bad noise, I'm sorry. Um, I hold my hands up on this one. It's a, oh, it's a really nice slipcover as well. And, and well, I wish they would be more consistent because some of the slipcovers they do in the premium collection are glossy and some are matte. And I love it when the the silver banner is, is kind of glossy and you get the nice matte finish on the actual slipcover, which is really nice and it doesn't pick up uh, fingerprints as much. So let's check out the um, the inside here and yes it is blu-ray the alternate widescreen version is on blu-ray so you get two discs on that one so that's pretty cool but um, yeah and, and as always if you've seen any of these films I'd love to hear your thoughts on them down below obviously without spoiling anything because most of them I haven't seen um, next one I have seen in fact the next four I've seen this one is from 1981 and it's directed I believe by Lawrence Kasdan uh, let's see. Uh, yes, written and directed by Lawrence Kasdan, who, uh, of course, wrote uh, The Empire Strikes Back, one of my all-time favorite films in Return of the Jedi and The Force Awakens, but he also made um, The Big Chill. I really love that film. And this is another film of his I really enjoy, and it's called Body Heat with William Hurt and Kathleen Turner. Yeah, uh, this is kind of a... Kind of a noir of sorts, um, and it's a kind of it's set in a sweltering hot. Um, I think it's Florida, maybe. Will it say on the back? But it's uh, I think it's like set during a heat wave in Florida. So like everyone's always constantly mopping their faces with like you know napkins and stuff and handkerchiefs. And uh, I remember watching this uh, three years ago when we lived in London, and we lived above a, a dry cleaners, and so it heated up the floor. So in the summer, it was just absolutely mental hot. And I remember watching this and it felt like a 4DX experience in my living room because uh, it was just so hot when I watched it. It was perfectly fitting for the film. But this is a really good kind of uh, 
you know, uh, sultry. Is it, 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 on the back of the, the Blu-ray here, it says, aided by a sultry John Barry score. But sultry is like the word I would use to describe this film. It's a very... I really like the vibe of it. It's like a, it's, it's a really cool kind of... Um, do they call it neo-noir? You know, I'm not going to try and flex and try and pretend like I know the term, but it's it's not quite... Fil it is film noir, really. I mean, it is. It's kind of a film noir and more of a quote-unquote modern setting that's not exactly a 40s, you know, black and white 4x3 detective movie, but there's it, it's completely informed by film noir films from the past, but done in kind of a an 80s style, I think, but it's a, it's a really damn good film, and it does have... Um, I believe no, it doesn't. I thought that it had a commentary. There's some release that has a commentary that I was kind. Of, I think it was maybe Fatal Attraction has a commentary on it, and I really wanted to kind of listen to that one. But uh, there's a few featurettes on that, which is pretty cool. Now this one is apparently now already out of print. It is a brand new release, and it is Trading Places with one of the worst renderings on on the front cover I can imagine. It's like I don't know what they've done. It looks like. It looks like there's two images of Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd that have been like photoshopped together um, and pasted in really awkwardly. It kind of looks like it's painted. It kind of looks like a photograph. Um, and it kind of looks like neither. It's a really weird image. I don't know what's going on with that. If that's just... Uh, I think maybe they might have cut this out from the... I don't know, because like Dan Aykroyd's mouth looks so fucking weird. Like, what is that? What is going on there, honestly? Murphy looks a little bit more like a real person, but Dan Aykroyd looks like something like Fireman Sam. I don't know what's going on, but I, I feel like maybe they cut the bodies out of a poster and tried to do like a fancy, you know, the dollar bills effect. It just doesn't really work. But um, apparently now this is already gone. Like people can't find it. It's not available online. Uh, and this one does come in the kind of more Criterion style case, strangely. Uh, this has a new interview with the director, John Landis, and then all of the other um, original special features. I love this film. I, I absolutely adore Trading Places. It's one of the films that I grew up on when I was a, a young teenager on TV. I think I taped it off TV and just watched it over and over again. And the whole irony of the whole <laughs> one Canadian dollar was just brilliant. But I love their chemistry. I love the journey. It's a, it's a really fun film, Trading Places. Uh, one that I absolutely need to tap in my collection. And likewise with this next one. Um, and this is also from a new 4K film transfer, supervised by the directors. I actually want to pop this in and see what it looks like, because I recently watched it on Sky Cinema in HD, and it looked all right, but I'm intrigued to see if it looks, this looks really good or not. Uh, and it has a new it has two new featurettes, um, a Q&A with the directors of the film from 2020 in the Egyptian theater in Hollywood, just two months before the pandemic uh, kicked off. And then new interviews with the writers and directors of the film. And then the original special feature, which is a commentary by the writers and directors of Airplane. Which gets my vote for maybe the funniest film ever made. This has like the most laughs per minute of pretty much any film. Like Spaceballs gets close there for me, but I think this has such a universal quality to it. You know, like, all right, boys, let's let's get some pictures. And they just take all the photos off the wall. I mean, I just adore the humor in this film. We watched it last year, I think, and did a review for it for the Epic Film Challenge 2. It holds up. It really does. It's such a hilarious film. New extras, new transfer. Absolutely. Just, yeah, and I love that, that front cover. It's the classic poster. That's one thing that I really love about the premium collection is that they do use the original posters. Though I don't know what's going on there. I'm not sure about that one. I want to research that Trading Places poster to see if it's always been that awful. And maybe they're just reflecting what it's always looked like. Um, next up, we have, again, a newly remastered Blu-ray from a 4K, 4K film transfer. And, and, and this, is, this is interesting as well. You get these kind of director crossovers that don't seem to make too much sense. So one of the directors on Airplane is Jerry Zucker. Now, Jerry Zucker also directed um, Ghost. <laughs> it just seems really strange. Now, I, I know no one cares about this whatsoever, but just because I've already been talking about the, the release years, Body Heat was from 1981. Um, Trading Places is from 1983. A lot of 80s movies in this update, which I'm, I'm certainly happy about. I love 80s films. Uh, 1980, bang on the beginning of the decade for Airplane, and then Ghost is 1990? Yes, 1990, Ghost. 
I really like Ghost. I've only seen it once. I saw bits of it when I was a kid, and then Connie showed it to me, I think, in one of the movie marathons, the 24-hour movie marathons. And this one has a new special feature, a new interview with the director. Then the original special features, including an audio commentary. Um, I, I really like Ghost. You know, it, it, it's, it's sweet, it's sappy, it's sentimental, it's emotional, it's funny. You know, uh, I really like it and definitely wanted to have it in my collection and to watch it again at some point. I, I really like Demi Moore. I love, um, I was going to say Patrick Stewart then, Patrick Swayze. Uh, I love Patrick Stewart as well, don't get me wrong. The next one, this is one that um, I kind of picked up, and I, I guess at this point I should kind of outline, outline my methodology for for picking some of these things. And there's there's so many, you know, variables, but there's, there's usually some... Um, some point that intrigues me, you know. Look at the Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. It was, it really was that second disc with the new aspect ratio, which I know sounds crazy, but I, I love that, that element of film preservation and seeing different versions of films. There's just something really intriguing to me about that. I love the history of it. But it, it's usually an actor or a director, or you know, um, or the story. And this one was really the story. And I'd, I picked this up on the, sh most of, when I go into HMV, I usually kind of sit on the train and look at like what's in the, the, the offer uh, when it comes to the premium collection. And I kind of whiz through like, right, that's a maybe, that's a maybe, that's a definite, that's a definite. I make a little list and then I try and find what's there in the, in the store. And then, you know, if I, if I, I know, I, something catches my eye and it's very dangerous when there's a deal and you've got extra money, but um, then I just start picking out random ones and looking at ones I hadn't really considered before. So, you know, when you look at the page on hmv.com, yeah, you can just scroll down to the, you know, the synopsis, but there's, there's, there's really nothing quite like picking up a physical copy and just looking at the artwork, looking on the back and reading what it's all about. It takes me back to the, the video store rental days and there's something really sacred and special about that to me. So this one I just picked up and thought, well, what's this one all about? From 1979, it's time after time. So this um, stars Malcolm McDowell, I believe, yes and um, David Warner and Mary Steenburgen. So it's a good good three main cast members, if they are indeed the three main characters of the film. So, uh, yeah, so London 1893 is home to a killer with a macabre nickname and also to a visionary genius who would write the time machine. But what if H.G. Wells' invention wasn't fiction? And what if Jack the Ripper escaped capture, fleeing his own time to take refuge in hours with Wells himself in pursuit? So in modern day San Francisco, Jack the Ripper is running around and uh, H.G. Wells, uh, played by Michael McDowell, um, kind of <laughs> braves the new world of fast food and television far from the utopia that he envisioned. It just sounds like a blast. It might be shit, but I just, you know, I, I really want to check that out. It just sounds like it could be really fun. So, sue me. Um, next up, we have a, a film directed by Howard Hawks. Now, this is, you know, there's, well, there's a couple of things. So, the Howard Hawks thing intrigues me, because everything I've seen from him I've really liked. But it also stars Boris Karloff, who I, I'm quite a big fan of. And from 1932, and that's another reason I went for this, because it's from the 30s, and 30s is a big blind spot for me. And I, I, I really want to make a concerted effort to watch more films from that decade. It is Scarface. Um, so the original, I don't know if it has any relation whatsoever to the Al Pacino film, the Brian De Palma film, but, um, yeah, this is obviously, you know, set during the Prohibition era, um, in Chicago and it's, it's a gangster movie, you know, from the thirties. And the, I think the only one I've seen in that genre from that time period is, um, Little Caesar, but that's, uh, that, that's, I think it's a classic that I should see. Uh, maybe it isn't considered a classic, but again, the 30s is something I really need to dig into at some point. And we're not even halfway through. <sighs> Holy fuck. This could be my biggest Blu-ray update ever in terms of a single video and the most amount of titles from a single label. It just has to be. This one comes purely from the recommendation of one Ryan Chataway from 1973. Um... Who directed this one? It doesn't say. Sometimes they have the director on the back, sometimes they don't. Um, oh, Jerry Schatzberg. So this is Scarecrow, starring Al Pacino and Gene Hackman, two actors I'm you know, very much a fan of. I've never heard of this film before. I'm pretty sure um, my good friend Ryan Chataway hadn't either. 
Uh, if not, um, he was at least surprised that people don't talk about it, and he said that this might be, for him, Al Pacino's best performance, or if not, very close to it, and that alone intrigues me. So, yeah, um, that was purely... Ryan talked about it and bigged it up. I want to see it and check it out. Uh, th this is one that I... I tried to find the first time I went and I didn't, um, it wasn't there, I couldn't find it. I went online and it was sold out and I panicked that it was out of print because I, I suddenly really wanted this. Uh, I love the, the front artwork, this was from 1965, but I also just love the genre, the subgenre that it um, sits inside, I suppose, and it's Von Ryan's Express. What a fucking cool poster artwork that is. I mean, look at Scarecrow, that's like a fairly, eh you know, poster artwork. It's just an image from the film. And I think this is the original poster artwork. But you look at something like this and it's just gorgeous. What an incredible piece of artwork there. So from what I understand, um, in fact, I'll just kind of look at the back and kind of crib notes here. Um, it's set during 1943. Um, so there's Colonel Joseph Ryan played by says Sinatra, but I don't know if that's, who is that exactly? Frank Sinatra. Oh, it is. It is Frank Sinatra. So he's the he's the titular uh, Colonel Joseph Ryan, who is on a heavily guarded freight train um, as a prisoner of war that's headed to an internment camp in Austria, and they take over the train. They hijack it, and I believe that they they kind of tease him and call him Von Ryan. But I read a little bit of a synopsis online. I like the premise, but I love films set on trains or films that have a large chunk of their action taking place on trains. I think I've already mentioned this, or I will mention this in a future video that I'm thinking about um, doing some sort of train movie related marathon, which will um, include many films that have Express in the title, but Von Ryan's Express, there we go. We are now halfway through. <laughs> 1967, we'll jump right in with this one, Wait Until Dark. I know nothing about this one. It was talked up in Graham's uh, live stream that I did with him about the premium collection, and all the people in the in the, the chat were saying, "Get wait until dark, get wait until dark." It's fantastic. Audrey Hepburn, Alan Arkin, and I believe there's another actor in this who is uh, uh, Richard Crenna. Yeah, so it's like a really good cast. Don't know anything about it, but it's supposed to be like a thriller. I love the cast. People really bigging it up, so let's just go for it. I, I definitely noted that one down to throw in as the a potential title. This one's from 1939. Wait Until Dark was from 1967, I think I already said that. From 1939, so I'm, I'm glad that there's a few 30s movies in this um, this batch. <laughs> Though I think I'm pretty much done at this point. I, 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 there's not really many more. Um, I, I mean, if again, given an unlimited budget, there's probably like another six to seven or eight that I could probably scrounge up, but I'm definitely done for now. And and there was one more that I really, well, there was two more that I wanted, but you just have to draw a line. So the two that I didn't get, that I wanted to get was the original Pet Cemetery. I really loved the 2019 one. And Possessed, which sounded really good and starred Joan Crawford, I believe. Um, so I read the back of that and it sounded like it was going to be really good, but I just, I just, you know, there's only so much you can do, only so much you can buy. So this one is... A really great cast of, I mean, just looking at the two leading actors of this, it is The Hunchback of Notre Dame, Charles Lawton, who's just, I mean, just incredible. And then Maureen O'Hara, who is just a legend. So this was just a must for me. I, I feel like this is going to be really interesting to watch because he is such a fantastic actor. Uh, and there's an interview with Maureen O'Hara on the disc as well. And an Academy Award, Academy Award nominated short film, Drunk Driving, which is interesting. And... The Lone Stranger and Porky Cartoon. Very intriguing, but yeah. Um, Hunchback of Notre Dame in live action. I've never seen that story in live action, I don't think so. Looking forward to that. Um, this is informed by the original film that I bought in one of these two for £15 deals and watched last year and loved. And it is the 1962 version. There's been three overall, I think. This is the 1962 version of Mutiny on the Bounty. This one with Marlon Brando. And I think Richard Harris is... All, yeah, Marlon Brando. And Richard Harris. I mean... Mm. So we got Trevor Howard as Captain Bly. I kind of wish Richard Harris was Captain Bly. So he plays John Mills and Marlon Brando plays Fletcher Christian. I loved Mutiny on the Bounty. And I'm just intrigued to see a different take on the story. So, um, you know, and obviously knowing that... 
great actors like Richard Harris and Marlon Brando are involved. It's an even bigger plus, so I can't wait to finally get around to this. It's a three-hour epic as well and has uh, loads of vintage featurettes and alternate um, beginning and ending, ending sequence, so a uh, really damn good addition for a film that I'm really looking forward to checking out. Uh, this one is another kind of epic from 1966. Um, this is three hours long also, and it's called Grand Prix. Now, again, I looked at this and thought, well, not really, and I'm just kind of scanning through the cast here. James Garner, oh, James Garner, even Ray Saints, you know, he's... These legends of, of kind of Hollywood and stuff, and Jessica Walter, and Toshiro Mifune. Straight in the basket. <laughs> I don't care if he's in it for five minutes. I want to see Toshiro Mifune in this film. And there he is, poking his beautiful face uh, out of the crowd there. I, one of my favorite actors of all time, the Japanese legend. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and assume that it is a fairly small role, given it's a, you know, an English-speaking American film. But um, I, I'm hoping... Uh, oh, so that's interesting. Is this directed? Yeah, John Frankenheimer. I like John Frankenheimer. Okay. Yeah, so he directs this... Um, th the winner of three Academy Awards um, with split-screen images to capture the overlapping drama and orchestrating You Are There POV camera work to intensify the hard-driving thrills. So uh, I, I'm not the biggest fan of, you know, of... Of you know, of racing, but I kind of find it exciting, and I do like a lot of films that are, are revolving around that world. I love the two thousand thirteen film Rush, by um, uh, Ron Howard. Phenomenal film, but uh, yeah, that's one that I definitely will not get to anytime soon. But the involvement of Toshio Mifune is like, it's a definite for me. I like I have to see that because he's in it. Next one is from 1987. This was um, brought up during Graham's stream also, and I didn't realize that Kyle MacLachlan appears in this. And that was kind of almost enough for me. I love Kyle MacLachlan. You know, Twin Peaks for me is kind of a big thing and has been for a few years, but other things I've seen him in, I, I just love the guy and I love, you know, I really like his acting. I, I Actually, I will say I, that generally I don't love his acting. I think he's amazing in Twin Peaks. But uh, I just really like him as a person as well, you know, um, so I kind of, I feel this kind of loyalty to him. But this is from 1987, as, as I said, it's called The Hidden, which is, I believe, kind of a, it's kind of a, like, alien thriller or something like that. So, yeah, the terrifying rampage of The Hidden. So, yeah, inhuman killers uh, with an unearthly fondness for heavy metal music, red Ferraris and unspeakable violence. Sounds like it's going to be a little bit of fun, uh, to say the least. This one I looked at and thought, I should really get that. And then, nah, I'm not going to get that film. And then Graham said, oh, you should have got that. It's, it's awesome. I thought, oh, shit. Okay, so I grabbed it on the next round. And it is Excalibur. I mean, I love 80s fantasy. I really do. But I haven't seen anywhere near as much of it as I should have. 1981, uh, directed by John Berman. And there's a commentary with him on that. That's the only special feature. But... Uh, you know, so we got Helen Mirren. Um, that's the only recognizable name for me in the cast, but uh, I don't know. I'm kind of intrigued to watch it, you know, and I will watch it at some point. Um, and I believe I've seen this on video somewhere. This feels so familiar, this this artwork. I feel like maybe, maybe my stepdad had it on video, or maybe my granddad had it on video. I don't know. It'd probably be my, my stepdad rather than my granddad. This is another one I kind of passed on initially, then Graham sung its praises, so I went back in and, and picked it up. Uh, we have from 1974, The Yakuza. Uh, and I was, I was kind of intrigued, but, but not enough. And uh, I do like um, the lead actor in this. I'll get his name right, Robert Mitchum. Uh, and it was written, uh, or co-written by Paul Schrader, and directed by Sidney Pollock. And uh, so I, I'm not sure if it is set in Japan, um, haunting East Meets West head-on thriller, uh, a modern film noir in which honor and loyalty become issues of life and death. Violence erupts with the speed of a Tokyo-bound bullet train. But I don't know if it's really set in Japan or not, but you just have Robert Mitchum now in the back with a Japanese man. And I'm just, uh, yeah, so 100 years ago they were called samurai. I, I just, I, I don't know what to expect, but, you know, based on Graham's recommendation, I do feel like I should maybe give it a watch. Next up, we have a film that I did not realize until I looked on the back of the Blu-ray. This is a sequel, or a quasi-sequel, or a spiritual sequel to Chinatown, which I still haven't seen. 
But regardless, from 1990, The Two Jakes, which is a fairly recent release. Love Jack Nicholson, and, uh, you know, I haven't seen Chinatown, but uh, it might be a nice follow-up to it. It might be a terrible follow-up to it. I really don't know. Uh, this one, you know, I... This this is a, another one from a new 4K film transfer and uh, a new feature with Leonard Maltin, the legend Leonard Maltin. And you can play the songs from the film directly from the menu, which is, uh, you know, kind of the the kind of special feature you'd boast about on an old DVD, I guess. But from 1958, we have Elvis in King Creole. Or King Creole, I don't know how you pronounce it. I've never seen an Elvis film. Um, but I recently, a couple of years ago, watched the John Carpenter film Elvis, and that really got me interested in Elvis in general. Um, and so I would like to see an Elvis film, and apparently this is like, you know, one of the, one of the more not notable ones that he made. So, yeah, why not? I mean, that's, that's kind of a bit of film history there, an Elvis movie. So, you know, my dad's a big fan of Elvis, and I kind of grew up, you know, being surrounded by the music, and so it kind of has a special place for me, even though I'm not the biggest fan of his music in terms of knowing a lot of it, but anyway. I'm trying to zip through these last through here just for the for my sake and yours. So this is from 1976, and it is Robin and Marion. Now I like Robin Hood. Uh, I, I love the is it the 38 film. Um, I really enjoy that one, um, and I like the Disney film. But you know it's uh, it's been adapted so many times. But this is like a kind of, from what I understand, an older Robin Hood. Um, so yeah, the, the legend of Robin Hood continues, and we have Sean Connery and Audrey Hepburn together, but also Robert Shaw. I mean, Ian Holm, Richard Harris, I mean, holy shit, what a cast. What a cast. John Barry doing the music. I've never heard of this, you know, so I'm, I'm really intrigued about this one. Definitely not going to be at the top of my list to watch, but it's one that uh, I definitely would like to see, and it just has an amazing cast. I love Robert Shaw. Audrey Hepburn is, is great. Sean Connery you know, depending on you know how much he's into it, can be really great. And Richard Harris, I love. Ian Holm, I love. You know, and uh, this kind of period film isn't really my my number one favorite genre. But yeah, so from what I understand, it is. Yeah, many years have passed since uh, Robin Hood led the fight for the poor people of Nottingham. So I like how it's kind of like a you know Robin Hood the later years. You know, the Cappuccino years. <laughs> Uh, this was another one, much like Excalibur, it's of the same ilk to me. Uh, I don't know anyone in this, I don't even know the director, but it is another 80s fantasy film from 1983, Krull. I, I really have nothing else to say about that one, it just, you know, <laughs> and you kind of, I sat there and just looked at the, um, I, didn't, I didn't sit there, I stood there, I stood there in HMV, I looked at the front cover, I, I kind of laughed at how ridiculous it looked, you know. And then I looked at the spine and thought, ooh, that looks cool. <laughs> I like the fonts they've used, and yeah. Oh, major deja vu then, holy shit. I already owned this film, um, but it has a new filmmaker focus featurette with Leonard Maltin, and also comes from a newly remastered 4K transfer. I would again like to, to match this up to the, the previous edition I have to see if it looks... Um, a lot better, but um, even if it wasn't a newly remastered one, I kind of just liked having a nicer edition of this because it's from the great Alfred Hitchcock from 1954 to Catch a Thief with Cary Grant and um, uh, Grace Kelly. Um, really looking forward to seeing this at some point because I love both of these actors. And, and really, with Grace Kelly, it's purely a rear window. I love that film so much. I love her in that film so much, so uh, I'm looking forward to seeing more from her in that sense. Um, there's, there's just certain actors who I see in films. I mean, Donna Reed springs to mind. You know, I love her and It's a Wonderful Life, but um, I haven't really seen her much else. So there's just certain actors who I really love. I need to see more of them, and that's kind of the, the fun part of exploring new movies. Next up from 1972, this is not really my type of film at all. Um, it's from director John Huston, um, who gave an incredible performance in the 2018 film, um, The Other Side of the Wind the kind of uh, lost film from Orson Welles, but uh, he's more known as a director, of course, and this is a Western, and uh, doesn't really appeal to me, but we do have Paul Newman, uh, The Life and Times of Judge Roy Bean. I absolutely love Paul Newman, one of my favorite actors, 
I gotta see it. I just have to see it. It's it's Paul Newman. I can't I can't say no. I see Paul Newman. I I, I just buy. Um, so the last two. This one just sounds really cool. I love the title of the movie. I just love the title of the movie. It's got a great poster. Rock Hudson, Ernest Borgnine. It's a pretty good cast in terms of people I've seen before and have enjoyed in films from this era being the 60s and 50s. This is from 1968. Ice Station Zebra. What a fucking cool title for a film. What a fucking cool title that is. I love that. But I read the synopsis and it sounds like really cool. There is this literal Ice Station Zebra um, out in, I mean, in the North Pole. Um, they're in a US nuclear submarine and they're trying to find... Um, uh, to rescue uh, members on the weather outpost Ice Station Zebra. Um, but there are, there's suspicion and suspense and twists and an engrossing espionage thriller. Sounds like a lot of fun. This is like a proper like two and a half hour one as well. But they're the kind of films that I would have seen around my gramps, like, you know, in, in on the Saturday afternoon and seen bits of it and not been that interested. But they remind me of him, I think. Not that I even know that he's seen that film, but it's that kind of film that makes me think of him. And finally, um, from 1984, I can't believe it was actually released in 1984. It's 1984. <laughs> now, this is where it gets really crazy. They had one copy of this in my local HMV, but it wasn't in the slipcover. So I thought, ooh, this is one of the ones that's going out of print because there's no slipcover on it. And then the next one I went in, it had the slipcover. So I went, ooh, I'll get that. And I thought, well, what the fuck am I doing? Like, let's have a look at it. What, what is this thing? You know, John Hurt. And like, ooh, I'm instantly drawn in with, with John Hurt. And then it's John Hurt and Richard Burton. And it's just like, hmm, that is a good cast. And I know that 1984 as a story is one that, you know, the George Orwell classic is something that is revered. And I don't really know much about it. I know the, you know, the kind of how people apply it. And how people use it in kind of the, just the, the casual vernacular and stuff. And always oh, like 1984 and Big Brother and all that. But I've never actually experienced the story. And with John Hurt in the kind of, I'm assuming, lead role. Um, and he's apparently perfectly cast as the doomed rebel. Um, so And it seems like the foil is Richard Burton's character. But yeah, 1984. And that's is not the long i think i have done a longer update in, of the, than this um i can't get my words out with uh, this dry math that's going on because i've been talking for so long i think i have done a longer blu-ray update that's longer than 45 ish minutes but again i can't think of a single label that i have bought not that even the premium the premium collection isn't really a label i don't think is it can you really class it as one i don't know but it is like HMV exclusives. Maybe it's the, the HMV boutique. I don't know. But um, from one line, one kind of collection, I don't think I've picked up as many um, in a single update. But I mean, these are bought over, you know, a few, you know, a few weeks. <laughs> that excuses the, <laughs> the amount that I've spent. But um, anyway, uh, let me know about any of these films if you've seen them. I now add another 30 to the collection, but I, I, I'm definitely calming down on this. And I never buy them at full prices. So, I mean, two for 15 pounds is a pretty damn good deal for these. And I really haven't gone wrong with hard... I mean, there's one... I mean, I've got the whole thing. I, I guess I can kind of just briefly look at some of the ones that I have seen. Uh, My Own Private Idaho is fantastic. Um, Badlands is really, really good. Um, Dolores Claiborne, fantastic. Mutant on the Bounty, phenomenal. Scanner Darkly is the one that I, I'm the least keen on. Um, I, I kept it because I might want to return to it, but yeah, I have mixed feelings about that film. We talked about it in one of the 24-hour movie marathons. Dinah is brilliant. The Adventures of Robin Hood I loved. Gremlins 2 is a favorite of mine. Um, the Ten Commandments, absolute classic. Um, Blow, fantastic film. Little Shop of Horrors, a favorite of mine from childhood. Um, Point Blank is fantastic. Um... The Haunting is brilliant. I love The Haunting. King Kong, absolute classic. The Shining, masterpiece. The Maltese Falcon, fantastic. And um, I believe that's it. Where's... And Village of the Damned, the original Village of the Damned, I really enjoyed. So, yeah, there really hasn't been one that I haven't liked so far. But that obviously shows you that I still haven't watched all of these. But that's kind of just the ongoing fuckery that is my collection. So anyway, thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed. And I'll see you in the next video. Hey, you're alright by me. <laughs> Apart from the fact he throws cans and call it into a tree. <laughs> yeah, he's really cool. Yeah, he's really cool.
<laughs> but he's not quite as cool as you. <laughs>